they gave him a purple cloak and twisted together a crown of thorns. They put these on his head. Hail, King of the Jews, they said, as they struck his head, and they spit on him, and mocking him, they knelt down to him. After this, they put his clothes back on him, and led him out to be crucified. The charges against him that would hang on his cross read, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. They brought him to Golgotha, and at the third hour they crucified him and divided his garments and cast lots for them, as it was written. And about the sixth hour there was darkness that fell over the whole land while the sun's light failed and the curtain of the temple was torn. Then Jesus, calling out with a loud voice, said, After this, he breathed his last. He bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Truly, this was the Son of God. third day, Mary and others went to visit the tomb, and angels stood before them asking, Why do you seek the living among the dead? Jesus is not here, for he is risen. And Jesus walked with the disciples and explained all that the law and the prophets had written of him. And he was shown to be the Son of God when he was raised from the dead by the power of the Holy Spirit. He is Jesus Christ, our Lord. For we died and were buried with Christ by baptism. And just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glorious power of the Father, now we also may live new lives. So yes, crucify him because we needed new life. We needed to be saved. Our sin had condemned us to death. But Jesus made a way for us. That agony would have been ours for all eternity had he not come. But praise God that he didn't just endure the cross. Praise God that he didn't just come to die. He came so that we might live. Heavenly Father, we praise you this day. We thank you, God, for the awesome, undeniable gospel truth that for God so loved the world, us, that little blue ball on that screen a moment ago looked so peaceful from so far away. But that wasn't enough, Lord. Thank you for invading our world to come just like we came into this world, born with human skin, lived among us, lived a perfect, righteous life, the Son of God revealed among man, to be betrayed, beaten, crucified, but on the third day, today, in history, resurrected from the grave. Father, we praise you, we thank you, we gather around your word as family. And we celebrate, no doubt, what we'll do for eternity, this truth that we have with us today and forever. 
in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen. amen. Welcome, everybody. We're so glad that you are here. And um, it's been great that you've been able, you were able to make it, obviously, you're here. <laughs> we had our doubts after last service because um, the, the place was packed and just overwhelming everywhere. So thank you for your patience. Uh, I think we had, I'm not sure, but I think we had mo most of the people came at 5.30 this morning. So that was, that was a blast. That was beautiful and awesome as well. So I'm going to ask you to stand for the reading of God's word. I will read it if we'll just look at it together. By the way, before I read this, um, this is one of four gospel accounts. For those of you who are not aware, the four gospel accounts, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, uh, selectively this week I've picked from each. But just realize what you're about to hear is eyewitness accounts recorded and stands the test of time. If you're here today and you're saying, I'm just doing my thing. Well, we're praying that this thing on the wall, on the screen, does its number on you. Amen. Because you need to know the love of God. Amen. So listen carefully to what the Bible has to say. Now, on the first day of the week, very early in the morning, they and certain other women with them came to the tomb, bringing the spices which they had prepared, but they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. And then they went in and did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. And it happened, as they were greatly perplexed about this, that behold, two men stood by them in shining garments. Then as they were afraid and bowed their faces to the earth, they said to them, why do you seek the living among the dead? He is not here, but is risen. Remember how he spoke to you when he was still in Galilee, saying, the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men. We learned on Good Friday, church, that Jesus started telling them that six months before he ever went to Passover down in Jerusalem. And they crucified him, and be crucified. And the third day, rise again. And they remembered his words, then they returned from the tomb and told all these things to the eleven and all the rest. It was Mary, Magdalene, Joanna, Mary, the mother of James, and the other women with them who told these things to the apostles. The apostles, the great men of faith, the apostles. Watch how they received this. And their words seemed to be like idle tales, and they did not believe them. But Peter, thank you, Peter. But Peter arose and ran to the tomb, and stooping down, he saw the linen cloths lying by themselves, and he departed marveling to himself at what had happened. What an awesome moment. Look, on the screen, what we just read a moment ago, somewhere, somewhere you're probably in there. You might be in between a few verses. But um, there's, they're, they're the skeptics. There are those who at least wanted to go worship, but they didn't quite know exactly what was going on because after all, Jesus is dead. There are those who are just, they're pretty flat out set against that what these women are babbling about right now, there's just nothing but fables. So as we go through our study this morning and our celebration of this day, I'm gonna ask you right now while, why I while I have you here, because you know, sometimes there are some people who come once a year, and this is one of those days. So I want you to hear the truth today, because you need it really bad. We all need it really bad, because in this world in which you and I live in right now, it's, the truth has never become more precious, and in some cases, rare. So Lord, I pray for the extraction, as it were, of the truth that's written on these pages of our Bibles to be embedded in our hearts. We ask it, Father, in Jesus' name, and all God's people said, amen. amen. You may be seated, church. We've been looking this Passion Week at a message titled, Out of the Darkness. 
and we've been systematically going through what does that mean out of the darkness. We started with Palm Sunday last Sunday where Jesus out of the darkness brought the gospel message and fulfilled so many Old Testament prophecies on what is called Palm Sunday. In fact, listen, God who knows all things knows that down deep inside there is this nature of yours and mine that we long for forgiveness. We long for eternal life. We really do. Even if you're an atheist today, in relationships, you long for forgiveness. And even as an atheist, if you are, you still think about eternal life. It haunts you. You say, how do you know? Because the Bible says God has written eternity in your heart. That means every night you lay your head down at night and you're thinking, Boy, I sure hope my atheism is right, because if I'm wrong, I'm really wrong. (laughs) But you might be a believer today in the sense that you know who Jesus is, right? Merry Christmas, Jesus, in the little nativity scene, Jesus? No. According to the Bible, out of the darkness is the fact that Jesus Christ, according to the Old Testament scriptures... And according to eyewitness accounts in the New Testament, rose from the dead, and you might find it quite stimulating to consider what you've probably never heard before. For example, to set you up, you might have heard of somebody by the name of Aristotle, for example. Galileo. Uh, Plato. Caesar. Which one? Pick one. How do you know? What about people of antiquity that you've studied in school? What about Homer? Listen, what about William Shakespeare? What documentation do you have that those people existed? You've never doubted their existence, not once ever. But they're stacked up, as it were, in your hearts and minds as pillars of history. But all the evidence that proves their existence is just a drop in a bucket to the evidential facts regarding who Jesus Christ is, who Jesus Christ was 21 centuries ago, that the world takes notice of who he is. But in the Bible, in Roman history, in secular history, And every day that you look at a calendar, you attest to the fact that when Christ came into the world, his birth into this world changed the very calendars by which we use. There's more evidence for the person and for the resurrection of Jesus Christ than any other person that ever stepped upon this planet in antiquity, Jesus. There is no reason why you should not bow your knee to God in Christ Jesus, the Savior of the world. Because friends, listen. You need to know the truth. And the truth is liberating. He brings us out of the darkness in everything he does. Oh, it was so great this morning. 5.30 service started. It was cold. People were bundled up. Uh, and it was just black, dark outside. And thousands of people had gathered together in this pitch black dark. And then eventually the sun began to rise. And out of the darkness came our vision. We could see one another better. Out of the darkness came the truth as it was presented. Oh, the Bible tells us regarding the resurrection of Jesus Christ. That it is so absolutely powerful. That even to those today who deny it know that they're going against the overwhelming truth that God revealed. God didn't leave it up to humans to propagate his truth so that other humans would believe it. God gave us his truth and we're supposed to run with his truth. And down deep inside, everything Jesus answers coming out of the darkness and into the light of life answers the pursuit of your soul. Everything about it. We'll see that today. By the way, as we dive into this, keep this in mind. In Romans chapter 1, verse 16, Romans 1, 16, the Bible says, Paul is speaking to the church at Rome, for I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. 
That's the reference to the crucifixion and resurrection of Jesus. For it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes. The power of the cross. The power of the empty tomb. I've told you guys before, by the way, both locations, it's irrelevant. If you and I went to LAX right now and we got on uh, the Israeli airline, El Al, if we got on like we do when we go there, it's last time I went, it was 15 hours and one minute. I'll never forget that. 15 hours, nonstop, one minute. You leave LAX, you land in Tel Aviv. And traffic permitting, in 45 minutes, you're in Jerusalem. You go over to the garden tomb, and it's preserved right there. And you see this incredibly massive, awesome tomb. And you stand in line, and you finally get to the entryway, and you look inside with your camera or with your phone to take a picture, and uh, there's nothing in there. Absolutely nothing. And that is the foundational fact of Christianity. Amen. You can't find the bones of our Savior. You can't find the remnants of his garment or of this or of that. He's, listen, he rose from the dead. He left an empty tomb. And, and if that wasn't enough, the awesome fact that just days earlier, Jesus is crucified on a place called Calvary. And John said that the location of where the cross was at to where Jesus was put into the tomb was a stone's throw away. That's estimated to be around 100 to 150 feet away. Guess what? When you get out of that airplane and we drive on up to Jerusalem, do we find? We find a garden. A large one, which means it was owned by a very wealthy individual. And a stone's throw away, just a little bit to the northeast from that spot, you hit a hillside that looks like a skull. And Calvary is the word Golgotha, which is the word skull, or the mount of the skull. And the Bible says that's where Jesus was crucified. Our faith is founded upon fact, my friend. And uh, I'm happy to tell you that we're not inviting you today to come to this church. We're not inviting you to sign up. We're not inviting you to get any religion. You don't need any of that. You need Jesus personally, like never before. You need him, you and him. That's our invitation today. We don't want your money. We don't want your attention. We want you to go to the word of God and understand this. Our agenda is this, that you might meet him and know him. Number one, coming out of the darkness, Jesus destroyed the grip of the grave. Think about it. The Bible tells us that Jesus died on the cross but before he died on the cross, he was examined by Herod. He was examined by Pilate. The Roman Empire examined him. By the way, legally, the Roman Empire issued their statement regarding Jesus' kangaroo court trial that he was held to. By the way, all that stuff recorded in the Gospels about Jesus being judged by this group, then taken over to the Sanhedrin, the Pharisees. Did you, listen, that was all illegal, but they did it anyway. Kind of sound familiar these days? <laughs> um, they did it anyway. And then Herod and Pilate, representatives of the secular Roman Empire, said, we find no fault with this man. He's to be let go. And the people insisted, crucify him, crucify him. But the Bible also says, little did they know that they were fulfilling the will of God. They even said, do it. Let his blood be upon us and upon our children. And little did that Pharisee know that he was speaking actually a prophetic announcement that the only way to get into heaven is to have the blood of Jesus Christ applied to your life. Oh, not physical blood. There's a blood stronger than that. Amen. It's the blood that Christ provided for our salvation. But I love the fact that when Jesus came out of the darkness, so to speak, when he came out of that tomb, and we celebrate this day of resurrection, that he absolutely destroyed the grip of the grave. So that is like the law, for example. The law walked around Jesus... And the law couldn't find any problem with them. The Ten Commandments went up one side and down the other. Couldn't find any flaw in Jesus. That's not true about you. It's not true about me. 
because Jesus made it really clear. If you think you've kept the Ten Commandments, you need to wake up and read what Jesus said. Jesus said, if you thought about committing adultery, lusting after somebody, or any one of the commandments, you're guilty of them. And the Bible says if we break one, we're guilty of how many? All of them. You say, Jack, can I get some encouragement here? Just stay seated. I'm getting there. The Bible says we've all sinned and come short of the glory of God. But before you quit in panic, know this. God doesn't wash his hands of us. God announces the gospel and says, I'm going to wash you by the blood of my sacrifice on the cross. And when he did that, the perfect man, Jesus, went to the cross and died in our place. According to the Bible, you and I are condemned by our sins And we will receive eternal judgment apart from Christ. But God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever would believe on him would not perish but have everlasting life. Now that is, listen, that is one statement that shows you the darkness and the other statement that announces to you the light. And the opportunity is before you to consider Jesus today. That what Jesus did to the power of the grave is that he yanked your soul, as it were. If you'll trust him, he yanked your soul from the grip of the grave, if you'll let him. It's awesome. I'm talking today about you finally becoming a follower of Jesus Christ once and for all. You think this world's getting any better? The wheels are starting to come off the proverbial chariot in this world. Christians are going, look, among us, I know know that's not all of you Christians, but among Christians, we're going, any day now. (laughs) There's a sense of urgency that we sense, and it's like, wow. The other day I was on an interview, and one of the the TV hosts said, uh, said, uh, he he, he doesn't know me, I don't know him, so he called me Pastor Hibbs, or I think he called me Reverend Hibbs. By the way, I've been introduced before speaking at a conference and they introduced me as doctor. It was so easy. But he said, Pastor, didn't Jesus say there'd be days like this? And immediately in my mind, I thought of that song. Yes, yes. Jesus said there'd be days like this. That's why the believer is not shaken at a time like this. You want to know why? Jesus ripped the grip of the grave away from us because God's word tells us everything that we need to know and everything that about the future. We see what's happening among nations, even our own, and cultures around the world, even our own. And the Bible anticipated all of it if you'll just know where to study and read it. God wrote it down in advance so that you wouldn't be shaken. But I love the fact that he just began to rip the The grip of the grave. A lot of people, I understand this. I was too one day, afraid to die. Death haunts us. But the believer, listen, the believer is rescued from the fear of death. It's a strange thing. I'm having a hard time to find words to express it to you. Now, don't get me wrong. Listen. The believer knows that the moment death comes, the grave has no hold on us. The Bible says to be absent from this body is to be present with the Lord instantly as a believer. But the grave, Jesus walks out of it on this day in history, changing everything. That changes everything, friends, about everything. The meaning, the purpose of life. What do you live for? What, what do you value? What's really important? Opinions versus truth. All the dynamics that are going on in the world. What do you know for sure? This I know for sure. The one that rose again from the dead gave us the word of God and Jesus fulfilled prophecies. How can you know that Jesus is the one? Fulfilled biblical prophecies. Nobody can boast this. Jesus rose from the dead. And there are people that have come and gone since then, and not one of them have performed what Jesus said he would perform. What do you think of that? Joseph Smith is dead. Confucius is dead. Buddha's dead. Muhammad's dead. 
Jesus said, I'm going to live, I'm going to die, and then I'm going to live again. And on the third day, I'll be raised from the dead. He said that six months before they ever went to Jerusalem. But you read it a moment ago in that video. Jesus also announced, was this all not to happen according to the law and the prophets? He was announcing that all of the Old Testament was speaking about me. Keep your eye on me, Jesus would say. Why? Because he breaks the grip of the grave. I heard the strangest thing. My brother came in uh, the other day from Utah where he lives, and he came to service on Friday. And uh, it's still hard for me to believe. It's crazy. I texted him the other day saying, did that really happen? He's got a friend that said, you need to come down in my, in my uh, basement. You need to see what I've been working on. So he goes down in the basement to see what he's working on. And you know what the guy was working on? He was working on, he built himself a custom casket. Have you ever thought of such a thing? I've never thought of such a thing. Why would I? Number one, who's going to see it? And you got all these bells and whistles and stuff. And you know, like, what? Has anyone told the guy that he's going to be dead? Oh, but I got a custom. It's like the guy that was buried in, in L.A. in Bel Air. He's buried in a Ferrari. He had to buy up four lots. They buried him in, a, in his Ferrari. Where's he going? <laughs> Dude, the guy was buried in the Ferrari, man. Yeah, yeah well, fast is he going now? <laughs> I mean, think about the craziness of that. No, as a Christian, the Bible makes it very clear. The grip of the grave has been broken. We're not going to see the grave. You'll never be held in darkness. You'll never be held in torment. You'll never be held alone. It's never going to happen to you. It won't be happening to you. And the second thing is this. How did that happen? Because he absolutely overcame the power of sin. Only Jesus can do that. Listen, let's just face the music right now, everybody. And look, I get enemies every time I say what I'm about to say. So I'm going to say it really clear. The Bible is extremely clear about this deception that we've embraced. If you just live a good life, God will let you into heaven. The Bible says, no way. Well, as long as you're sincere, God will let you into heaven. The Bible says, no way. Well, if I just believe in all of the gods, then by virtue of, uh, you know, the statistics, I'll make it in. No way. By the way, let me be blunt. The, the only way you can get to heaven is if you are a sinner. So I, I don't know if I'd like to hear that. You want to go to heaven? Of course I do. Then that's how you have to come. You have to recognize that he who is the Savior, Savior of whom? Savior for what? The Savior saves us from our sins. And none, nobody wants to confront their sins, but I got you one day out of the entire year to tell you the truth, that here it is. He loves you so much that he wants you with him in heaven, and that he went to the cross to, listen, die for the sins of all mankind. He paid the price. Watch this, everyone. He paid the price for everyone but not all people go to heaven. See, wait a minute, what are you saying? I thought he paid the price for everybody. He paid the price for everybody by dying for the sins of the entire world. But only those who receive that gift will enter the kingdom of heaven. It's a choice that you make. By the way, that's how a righteous, holy, loving God, who's not willing that anybody would perish, but all would come to eternal life, that's how he remains perfectly pure, And he gets all the glory for getting you and I into heaven. We're going to applaud him and thank him forever. And at the same time, for those that are in hell, they only have themselves to blame because they refused the gift he offered. And that should bring silence to our ears. Because that's such a serious thing. You cannot deny the existence of sin. And Jesus said, I've come to take away the power of of sin, and I'm going to go to the cross, and I'm going to die for the sins of the world. Listen to this, Galatians chapter 2, verse 16. Galatians 2, 16. Knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, by being good, keeping the law, being religious, member of the first Baptist church, 
That doesn't count. But by faith in Jesus Christ, watch, even when or even we have believed in Christ Jesus that we might be justified by faith in Christ and not by the works of the law, for by the works of the law no flesh shall be justified. Is that powerful? See, pastor, if I can't get there by being good, how do I get to heaven? Understanding this, it's Jesus. Jesus is your answer, friends. That's why today's so amazing. You know what's so great about this? There may come a time in this America of ours that we will not have the freedom to gather like this. It doesn't change a thing. Did you know it doesn't change the facts? We were talking earlier before service today that there's believers gathering in certain North African countries that if they go to church today, there's a high probability that they're going to be killed. Let me ask you something. If there was a chance of you being killed for coming to church today, to worship the risen Christ, would you do what the North Africans are doing? Would you get up and come to church? Can you imagine getting dressed up to go to church to worship God, but there could be the chance of being killed because of your faith? There are nations in the world that live under that specter. Why would they do that? Because they know what it is to have eternity in their hearts and sin forgiven. Wow. Isn't that freedom to know, wait a minute, there's no rules or regulations that I'm supposed to keep to get into heaven? Not a one. The Bible says if we repent and believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, we shall be saved. That word is change your mind about Christ. Metanoia. Understand that he's the savior and I'm the sinner and I need him. And go to him. God is a person. You know, that's why you are a person. You have a personality. The reason why you're a person, you ever thought about, well, my parents brought me into this world. Why, why, listen, you're a person, your parents are persons, your grandparents were persons, people are persons. They have, they have personality. Do you know where that came from? God. We're the only ones created in this world that are created in the image of God. Remarkable. And he wants to have a relationship with you, just like you have with other people. He wants to live with you. He wants to talk with you. And he wants you to live in freedom. He wants you to know that you're loved. And that he loved you enough. He loved me enough to go to the cross. The Bible tells us that for the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross. I'm grateful for that. Also, eternal life. He came out of the darkness and Jesus brought forth eternal life. I love that. If you think about that, the tomb was emptied. In fact, let's be, let's be exact about it. In the morning, early, very dark, the women prepared the spices, which was illegal for them to do. It wasn't kosher for them to be working on Saturday. They were supposed to rest. The women, they decided, who cares about the law? If Jesus is dead, we're done. We're going to go give our last bit of devotion to him. And they prepared spices. They didn't get a chance to do that when his body was taken down from the cross. So the women, they had a plan. Let's go to the tomb with our spices. Maybe we can find somebody to roll away the stone. And then they would pour the ointment and the myrrh and the fragrance over his wrapped body. That's what they were intending to do. So friends, listen up. Those who knew him the most thought that they were going to go see his body. Okay? They show up. There's a big earthquake, the Bible says. And an angel rolls away the stone. And the women peek in. They go and run and tell the disciples. And thank God Peter has got enough doubt in his mind to jump up and run. The Bible tells us that John started running behind him later. And uh, they're both going to the tomb. And Peter and John, they look inside and there's nothing inside there. But check this out. The Bible says an angel rolled back the stone. He was already gone. See, didn't the angel roll back the stone and then he came out? No, no, no. As I said at sunrise service, in our minds we're thinking, you know, God's orchestrating all this. There's headsets and microphones, okay? Okay. <laughs> Um, angel descending, descending angel, earthquake, shaking. 
women running to the tomb, and angel, roll back stone. And there's no Jesus behind saying, when is this, are we sure we're on time? The stone wasn't rolled away so he could get out. You know the answer. The stone was rolled away so they could get in. To see what? Evidence. Evidence. Nobody was there. He was risen from the dead. And then Jesus started appearing. And as the women ran back the second time, the Bible tells us that they saw him and they grabbed him by the legs and they hung on to him. And Jesus told them, rejoice. Go and tell the disciples, I'll meet them in Galilee. Isn't that awesome? You can see those women. I would love to see it in slow motion. They're running, they see him. What? <laughs> and then... <laughs> and they got him. And you know what they were thinking? I know they were thinking this. There is no way we're going to let go of him now. Mad after all this. We're not letting go of him. Well, the good news was the resurrected Savior will never let go of you. That's the good news. He will not let go. Why? Because it's the desire that you experience eternal life. And don't tell me that you don't want it. You've all grieved over the fact of a, a funeral that's in, interrupted your life, haven't you? We all have. And a funeral, the death of a loved one, seems wrong. It should seem wrong. You were made to live. Jesus came to give life. Satan came to take it. By the way, Jesus said Satan starts out by murdering people by telling them lies. Isn't that key? Lie to people. That's Satan's motive. Lie to people, that's his process of murder. Start lying, lead them down a path of total destruction. He's been doing it for thousands of years. It works. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no man comes to the Father but through me. And then also this, Jesus comes out of the darkness with an assured hope. He comes out with an assured hope. The hope of the believer is way different than the hope of the world. The hope of the world, you know, if you get on a if you get on an airplane, you hope it makes it to its destination. You, you hope you make your gate in time. You hope the ship stays afloat. Uh, you hope, you know what I'm saying? You hope it doesn't rain, that kind of stuff. Somebody says something to you. Hey, I'm going to do this for you. And, well, I hope so. You're not exactly sure. God doesn't roll like that, friends. When God says you can hope in him, it's an assured hope. We would say you can take it to the bank, but that's a bad illustration these days. <laughs> Don't take it to the bank. Uh, <laughs> when God says something, he keeps his word. When Jesus is a man who dies believing in me, yet he lives. Think of that. As a follower of Jesus, if you understand, Jesus said you must be born again to enter the kingdom of heaven. Born a second time. Born of the spirit is the technical word. You were born of this earth. Now you need to be born of the spirit. Jesus is the person that's born of the spirit. Has life. Will never see the grave. Will not lose hope. Our young people today need hope. They need to know that God loves them. They need to go, listen, they're so unhappy with life that they're going about to change themselves and God says, wait, 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 excuse me, can you let me try that first? I am the great transformer. Jesus Christ changes lives. He's done it to me. He's done it to many of you. And if we're honest, if it wasn't for him, we'd probably be dead by now. I know that's true about my life. Hope. How do we know for sure? Jesus kept the promise of the scriptures. How do we know it's this Jesus? Isn't there all kinds of Jesuses being preached out there? Yes, there is. This is so cool. The Bible warns us that in the last days, which you and I live in, the Bible says, are you guys listening? Yes. The Bible says in the last days, this is how you're going to know you're in the last days, is because there's going to be people coming preaching a different Jesus and different gospels. 
other ways to heaven. They'll say, this Jesus of ours does this, but you've got to do that. They'll say this about their Jesus, but then you've got to pay this much or do these things. And the Bible warns that in the last days, many false prophets and false teachers would arise. I love the fact the Bible tells me that in advance. Isn't that great? Don't you feel a little secure? Um, I like, because technology allows this now. Have you been on a flight where the pilot says, uh, I'm going to turn the seatbelt light on now? You say, you're thinking, what is, what's wrong with him? It must be bumpy up there where he's at, because it's fine where I'm at. No, he says, we're going to uh, go into some turbulence in a few minutes. So I'd like you to put your seatbelt on. I don't know about you, but that gives me great comfort that he knows what's going on. Can you imagine finding an airplane and some big thing happens and the guy goes, whoa, I didn't see that coming. <laughs> like, can I get out now? <laughs> Jesus said, I've told you these things in advance that when they happen, you will believe that I am he. The scriptures. On this day in history, come this evening. So at about this time, in about five hours from now, 21 centuries ago, it's Sunday evening, and two disciples are walking back to their home to Emmaus, and the Bible tells us that Jesus suddenly appeared next to them, and he said to them, why are you so sad? And they said, what do you mean, why are we so sad? Are you, not, are you a stranger in this area? Don't you know what happened? And Jesus I mean, you got to, this is God talking. This is awesome. Jesus says, what things? Is that awesome? If I were God, I would have said, of course I know everything. Jesus goes, what thing, what, what happened? It's concerning Jesus. We thought that he was mighty in all of his deeds and works. His, he was amazing, sent from God. We, we thought he was the Messiah. He did all of these things. But it's the third day. There were reports of women seeing him earlier this morning, but. And Jesus says to them, Oh, foolish ones. We would say today, You're so silly. What? What? Don't you know what the scripture said from, from the Old Testament announcements about him? That the Christ must suffer first and be crucified, but on the third day be re resurrected from the dead and enter into his glory. And the Bible says Jesus opened up to them the scriptures from Moses to the prophets. He gave them an Old Testament Bible study right then and there about himself from the Bible. The Bible, listen, the Bible doesn't speak about Karl Marx. The Bible doesn't speak about Donald Trump. It doesn't speak about Jack. It doesn't speak about you, about being the centerpiece and focal point of the Bible. The centerpiece and focal point of the Bible is one person. His name is Jesus. Yahushua. Or we say, we would say Joshua. The whole Bible. The scriptures. Next, we see that Jesus coming out of the darkness takes us in with a, a whole new love. And when I say new love, I want to be careful what I mean by that. I'm talking about a love that God has. I'm not talking about human love or what humans think is love. Let's listen. I'm going to confess for all of us. Our love's messed up. We're flawed creatures and we have we have flawed love. God loves perfectly. In fact, the Bible says God is love. Not love is God. But see, in our culture today, some people have made love their God. No, God's the one who loves. And when he loves, my friend, it's an absolute, awesome, perfect, precious, unconditional, never-ending, always present, love. A love that according to biblical theology, I, me, right now, I can choose to live any kind of life I want to choose right now. I can do anything I want. Watch this. Listen, track, 
Follow me. According to the Bible, I could do anything I want. But I've been born again by the power of God. So what does that mean? I can, I'm free to live any kind of life I want, but I choose to live for Jesus. Why? Why? Because somebody's got my arm? No, no. Gun to the head? No, no. Because that's your job? No, no. Because when somebody loves you and you're smart about it, you love them back. Listen, friend, listen, young people, you find somebody who loves you, you better hang on to them. Okay, because you're not such a fantastic thing that you think you are. <laughs> so, but have you seen my hair, Pastor? I mean, look at this. <laughs> no, here's the deal. Here's the thing. Somebody loves you, but you need to do is figure out how to love them back. And that's what the Christian life is all about. Lord, you love me. Isn't it, isn't it amazing? He loves us. That's hard for me. When I was a brand new Christian, I had a hard time with that. God loves you. Chuck Smith, he was my pastor. He'd, he'd smile <laughs> and say, God loves you. And I'm thinking, everybody around me, God loves, but I know me. And there ain't no way. And I actually went to a pastor for counseling. And I told the pastor, I said, listen, I got a problem. Here's the deal. Well, this love stuff. I think it's a little naive. And he let me spout off. And they said, are you all done? Yeah, I'm done. Pretty much. And uh, he goes, if you can't deal with God loving you, let's start here. He likes you. And I went, that was, that was like a lightning strike. I could understand like. I couldn't relate to love. God likes you. God loves you. He actually wants to be with you. The whole new love that he gives. You can't push him away. But you've got to come to that love. You've got to accept them. Like any precious love, it's mutual. But we will never love him as he loves us. It's impossible. Of course, he's God. But I want you to know today, in this world, people are giving up on their lives because they don't believe there's a reason to live or that anybody loves them. I want you to know it's a lie from Satan, and it's time to hand over the steering wheel to God. It's time to stop trying to control your life or make your life happen. Surrender to God. I don't care if you're lost on the streets of L.A., or you're on Wall Street in New York. You need the same God, the same Christ, the same blood, the same message. Jesus loves you, and God wants to forgive you of your sins, but you've got to come to him. And you've got to come to him on his terms. Jesus said, if you'll come to me, I will in no way turn you away from me. What an awesome truth that is, which leads us to, how does he do that? He gives us salvation. Jesus comes offering you and I his gift. Now, this gets people going, a gift. We make a big deal of this stuff all the time. You know why we struggle with this? And I'm speaking for all of us right now. We have a hard time with gifts. Oh, what's that? I got you. It's a gift. Thank you. We lie. <laughs> they hand it to us. Thank you. That's so, oh, that's awesome. Thank you so much. Wow. Either A, we really don't think it's awesome. We're trying to figure out what to do with this thing. <laughs> or if it is awesome, we're thinking, no, what am I going to get him? <laughs> right? It's kind of weird. Oh, thank you. That's a great gift. And, oh, man, I got a little store tomorrow. I got to get him something now. <laughs> Have you noticed when there's, when there's some people who like, they'll come to your house? It's just the way that they are. They, they come to your house and they always bring something. They have a plant. It's a, you know, an orchid or something. It's something. And it's like, hey, how you doing? That's great. That's wonderful. And then there's some people who come. They don't bring a thing at all. But you, you know them. You just know how this goes. But listen, a gift is basically worthless to you personally unless you accept it. But not only accept it, you've got to realize that you need it. I need that. I'm looking at somebody right now. I won't embarrass him, so I'll look the other way. <laughs> so he knew, he knew I needed a new pair of shoes. And uh, he got me a new pair of tennis shoes, and they're awesome. And I put them on. I took a picture, and I sent them to him. 
Why did I do that? It meant something to me. I didn't ask him for them. He just looked at my crummy shoes and thought, that guy needs a new pair of shoes. <laughs> and um, you've got to not only, listen, you've got to not only accept the gift, you've got to realize you need it. Well, can I just add Jesus to the rest of my memberships? Answer, no. No, you cannot. He's not an add-on. He's not a module. Jesus is not an app. He comes into your life. In a moment, I'm going to ask you to make a decision for Jesus. I've got to warn you right up front. When Jesus moves in, he takes over. I mean, it's kind of cute at first. You hear him speaking. It's kind of tense. You're going to feel it in a moment. Somebody, at least one person will. Statistically speaking. I hope so, anyway. At least some guy from Tennessee called last service and said, I want to accept Christ. He was watching on TV, and that was great. Buddy, we, we prayed for Buddy, and, and a Bible goes out to Buddy tomorrow. But, um, but what about you? See, inside, as this message starts to wrap up, you're going to start feeling a little anxiety. So what do you, anxiety? I'm in church. Should I not feel that? Oh, no, hang on. You're, it's going to, you're going to get it. The Holy Spirit's going to go, <clears throat> uh, you need to respond to that. I'm calling you. Yeah but, yeah, but you sound like my voice. That's because you're the only one you'll listen to. <laughs> you know it's not you because you would never say what you're about to hear. Listen, I'm laying it down pretty thick here, everybody. God, the Holy Spirit's going to speak to you and you're going to be shocked in a moment. It's like, where'd that come from? And in a sense, he's going to be right on the outside of your heart, so to speak. He'll only knock. And the longer you wait, by the way, it grows more faint over the days, weeks, or years. The Bible says when you hear God knocking, that today is the day of salvation, now is the acceptable time. So you get ready for that. If you start to feel anxious and like, honey, I think it's time for us to go. Just know this, the Holy Spirit is speaking to your husband about how lost he is. And how much he needs Jesus. And if the wife says, I think I left the pot roast going, let's go. Then the Holy Spirit is speaking to your wife about how much she needs Jesus. Are you with me? You understand? He's for real, everybody. He's alive. Okay? And you need to realize that. When he gives a gift, you ought to take it. And thank him for it. He wants to gift you salvation. You're not going to find it any other place, any other message, any other savior, there are none. It's only him. Number eight, Jesus comes inviting you to know him. I find this absolutely fascinating. Jesus comes out of the darkness inviting you to know him. The oldest book in the Bible... Some say it may be the oldest book in the world. They debate between some ancient Chinese. But the book of Job. And Job said, if a man dies, does he live again? That's the question we ask. But then when Job encountered God, Job said, I know that someday I will see God in my flesh. Job confessed that someday in a resurrected new life he would see Almighty God. And the Bible tells us that Christ is inviting you to know him. Jesus in the book of Revelation is knocking on the door of the church of Laodicea. It's a tragic story. It's a tragic account. He's knocking on the door and he's saying, Behold, I stand at the door and knock and if any man will open up, I will come in and sup with him and he with me. We'll have dinner together. In the Middle East, that means we'll be one. Isn't it fascinating that he's knocking on the door of a church? And he was on the outside of it. You can have all the religion you want and miss heaven altogether, my dear friend, because you don't know him personally. You want to know him personally. He invites you personally. Some of the greatest things in life is when you're invited. Isn't that precious? Am I invited? 
You look to see, did I get an invite? How come you got an invite? Have you noticed that? Were you invited? I wasn't invited. How'd you get an invitation? Almighty God, creator of the universe, the one who died on the cross and rose again from the dead, who took on skin to come into this world to communicate to you how much he loves you, says, I'm inviting you to know me. That should not be a stretch for you to embrace. I thought about this for a moment. Look, the Bible tells us in Ephesians chapter 3, verse 17 to 19. Check this out, Ephesians 3, 17. That Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. That you, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the width the, and length and depth and height to know the love of Christ which passes knowledge that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. That's a mouthful right there, is it not? He's, he's saying, I want you to know the love of God. It's wider, it's deeper, it's taller, it's bigger than you can imagine. I want you to know it. The problem is it's too big to know. Which explains why eternity is a long time. We're going to be getting to know him like this. But I thought about that. When Jesus was laid down on that cross and that Roman centurion was <laughs> pounding the nails into his hands, Jesus loved him. Jesus loved him. I thought about Pilate and Herod and the Pharisees, the godless, terrible Pharisees who thought they were better than anybody else. Jesus loved them. He died for them. All those that were spitting on him, when you, when you read the four gospel accounts, they put that acacia crown of thorns. It's horrific. If you've been to the Middle East, you've seen it. Each thorn is almost three inches long. And when you put it on somebody's head, or if you were to put it on somebody's head, the, the needles just touch your skull, your, your skin. And then the Bible says they took a staff, a rod. A, a, for us, it'd be like a baseball bat. And they hit it, and they drove that into his scalp. And he loved them. The Bible says in another place, they wagged their heads and stuck out their tongues. And they said, he saved others, let him save himself. If you're the son of God, come down from the cross. And do you remember what Jesus had said from the cross? Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. You know the stuff that I've done, you'll never know. And it was his love for me that woke me up. You know the stuff that you've done? You know the stuff that you, you hide, nobody knows. He knows. And he loves you. And he's saying, you come to me, let's get that taken care of. I want to wash all of that off of you. Have you ever seen when a mom, or even, it's not even, even a mom, have you noticed even animals? You see like when a little puppy or something's dirty, the mother will like lick its face and scrub its body as she licks it all clean. It's just so rough. But the little puppy's standing there getting like whacked around. Mom's cleaning them up, man. And you see like a good mom, you see the kid come in and then the kid's got whatever all over them. And the mom, she doesn't, she doesn't dab, isn't it? A little cotton ball. She goes, gets a washcloth, and she's just like scrubbing the kid, and he's moving around. Think about that. When Jesus, you come to him, and he says, you come here, you, you come here. He's not, listen, he invites you. He's not going to go grab you and drag you over here. He won't do that. He's not going to drag you down the aisle. But if you come to him, like C.S. Lewis says, he'll start to rearrange your furniture. He said, I'm moving in now. 
Are you, okay, that's awesome, yeah. Uh, here's what we're going to do. And he starts with your thoughts first, your thought life. Starts moving the things around in here. Well, we're getting rid of a couple of those things. This we'll deal with later. Will you let him do that? Especially if you're a doubter. Oh, I, I'd love, if you're an atheist today, you say, oh, I want to believe, but I don't. That's good. Tell him that. Watch what happens. Number nine, we're almost done. Jesus comes with great, with a one great desire, and that is to literally have you personally with him. <laughs> it's the book of Zephaniah. When's the last time, Christian, you read the book of Zephaniah? Did you get up this morning and read Zephaniah? If you would have, you would have come to chapter three, and it's the book of Zephaniah where God says to his redeemed, those who trust him, it implies that when we see him in heaven, he'll go like this. The Bible says he's going to sing. You mean we're going to sing? Yeah, 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 we sing too, but the Bible says he's going to sing. And the Bible says that he is going to surround us with joy. The Hebrew word implies he'll twirl, spin. You know when you're, you know like when, like, you're just really happy. It's just, well, all right, wow. Like winning the World Series or F1 or, you know, something, Super Bowl. Woo, people go crazy. According to the Bible, when you and I get to heaven, God is going to go, yes. Not like, yes, I didn't know if you were going to make it or not. <laughs> not like that. It's not like that. It's, yes, I told you, get over here. Oh, my goodness. Come here. And the Bible says he's going to sing and he's going to spin about. Zephaniah chapter 3, read it. See, that's kind of irreverent, isn't it? Yeah, if you're a legalist, I guess. But as we said on Friday, Jesus said, I'm not going to drink of this cup until you're with me in the kingdom of heaven. I love the fact that Jesus is like, Father, come on, when's, it, when's the time? I, want, I can't wait to drink this cup with them. And then we end with this, and it's a big end. Jesus comes out of the darkness with a simple question. What are you going to do with me? So Jesus takes his disciples to Caesarea Philippi. It's an amazing place. If you've been there, you know what I'm talking about. It's absolutely stunningly gorgeous. It's, it's like the foothills of the Sierras. It's gorgeous. And the Jordan River, by the way, comes right out of the ground at that point, right out of the, right out of the mountain, of the base of the mountain. It comes right out, comes out of the ground. And, and I, don't mean, I don't mean like a little thing. This is wide as the stage. Just gushing out of the ground, the Jordan River begins, comes out of a rock. And uh, about from here to that wall, it's about from here to that wall, maybe 200 feet. From one side to the other side, in Caesarea Philippi, all of these temples have been unearthed, and we've been there. Many of you have been there with me. And on one side, for example, there's the temple of the nymphs. Have you ever heard of a nymphomaniac? That's not a joke. A nymphomaniac was a person who worshipped at the temple of the nymphs. It's extremely erotic and very, very sexually and, uh, charged and dangerous. And then, then as you move over, there's another temple and another temple and another temple. All these various gods were worshipped there. And when you showed up, here were the rules. You showed up, you paid your fee, and then you got the idol that you were going to worship that day. If, if you wanted to worship five idols, then you paid for five idols. A little idol. You had a little Diana, you had a little Athena, or you had a little Zeus. And you went to that, or you, went, you got a little nymph. It's kind of like an uh, angel-looking thing. And you went there, and by the way, all of it's out in the open, under the bright sky, and uh, frankly, you get naked. And you pour yourself into that worship. Orgies, drunkenness, it's insane. Then when you're done, because you purchased four of them, you, you go to the next god, and it's Diana. And the temple prostitutes are there, and all of the stuff, and they had, it's unbelievable. All the way over to the temple of Pan, 
to the left. And I kid you not, what do you think the worship of Pan is called? Panic. People said, man, you're in a panic. The worship of Pan was so violent and so crazy and so wild that it often led to even death itself in worship of the pagan god. And here's what you were to do. Great is Diana, or hail Zeus. So Jesus has his disciples there. Can you imagine? I mean, that's like taking them to Vegas on a field trip. (laughs) And Jesus says, who do you guys say that I am? And you know, they got all nervous. Uh, Some say, uh, you're Elijah, come back from the dead. Uh, some say, and they all had the, <laughs> and then the father spoke to Peter, right? Because Peter, God bless Peter. Normally he says the wrong thing. <laughs> Peter says, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus says, my father told you that. So the question today is this, who do you say that he is? That answer determines your eternity. I'm going to ask you to bow your head and pray. I'll lead you. But here's that. Uh, lock the doors, ushers. Set, <laughs> set the guns to tase. No one leaves. This is the holy moment. This is what the whole thing's about right here. Can I remind you just to uh, upset you even more? Keep your money in your pocket. We don't want membership. We don't have membership here. So you can Relax and deal with God right now. Heavenly Father, I pray that you'd move in the midst of this place and God, that you would do what you do. That you would do what you've done to us here on this stage, that you'd do to the many that are here right now, even if it's one. That there's a heart today, there's a soul today waking up to the realization, I need Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. And yes, you do, my friend. You need to tell him that you've sinned against him like you would an offended friend. And that you're not worthy of his love or of his forgiveness, but you're asking him, Lord, please forgive me. I heard the gospel today that if I believe, trust in you, I can be saved from my sins and I can be given a life that is purposeful and meaningful and that I can live for you and die in this world, opening my eyes up instantly in your presence. I want my name written in your book of life, almighty God, Lamb of God. But I confess today that I'm a sinner and I believe you died for me on the cross and that you rose again from the dead. And 21 centuries removed, today's my turn. Friend, if that's your, listen, because time is late, And I mean it's late. We have another service to do. But that should add to the urgency of the moment. I'm not going to beg you. As we sing this song, if you are anxious on the inside, you need to get up, you need to come forward, and I'll pray for you. I'm not going to embarrass you. I'm not going to call you out by name. But if today you realize I need to come to the end of myself and I need to walk with Jesus from this moment forward. I don't want religion, and I don't want to do this on Sunday. I want to do this every day, every moment for the rest of my life. I want to be real. Then as we sing this song, no more games, no more religion, you get up and you come forward and we're going to close the deal today, finally for you, once and forever. So let's sing the song and you come. If God is speaking, respond to him. All these pieces broken and scattered Mercy gathered, mended and whole. Empty-handed, but not forsaken. I've been set free. I've been set free.
listen, if you are um, if you are in the overflow area, if you are outside uh, in the pavilion area or in the courtyard, make your way to the main sanctuary here, if you would. Just make your way. It'll take you about two minutes. Listen, G- listen to this. Everyone that Jesus invited into heaven, he did so publicly, including even Nicodemus eventually. He was the latecomer. But he eventually came. Nicodemus came to the cross finally. But everybody that Jesus invited, he invited personally, and they went public. And I'm going to ask you today, if you've never gone public with Jesus Christ, you need to do that today in your decision. Jesus said, if you are embarrassed of me, then I will be embarrassed of you before my Father. But if you acknowledge me before men, I will acknowledge you also before my Father in heaven. This is the hour of decision. Friends, this is the moment. Before this is over, quick, run if you must. But if you've got anxiety, like a little war going on inside your chest, that's the Holy Spirit speaking to you, and he's saying, get up and stand for my son. He hung on the cross for you. You can stand for him. You can make your way. Hurry, hurry. You take our failure, you take our weakness, you set your treasure in jars of clay, so take this heart, Lord, I'll be your vessel. come to you today and Lord your Bible tells you said it Jesus the letters are written in red your Bible tells us that when one sinner repents and comes to the Lord the angels in heaven rejoice what an amazing thought that is that right now as we sit here in Pacific time on this continent on this little blue ball in the middle of space Your Bible tells us that at this moment, angels are rejoicing over what's happening just here, right now. 
as you are here right now, bow your heads, or my friends, and pray this prayer. It's not a magic prayer. Here's what makes it special, is that you mean it. Don't discredit it for a moment that all of us are praying it. See, our God's personal. He sees your heart. Do you mean it? When you pray this prayer, he will accept it from you. Some of you may feel some strange feeling. It's possible. I hear about it all the time. I don't know that feeling, but I've heard it happening to people. Some of you will feel nothing. Happily, the Bible tells us that it's not based on feeling. See, today you made a willful decision, reasonable, logical, you responded. The Bible went up off the page into your ears and you decided, think about that. Your feet didn't get up and just leave you. Your will was changed. Many of you, a moment ago, your will was changed. You didn't plan on doing this and God has interrupted your life. My dear friend, get used to this because he's awesome. So will you pray this prayer out loud? Church family, if you'd like to join with them or maybe you're out there as a Christian, you want to rededicate your life right now. Repeat this after me. Dear Lord, I come to you a sinner and I need your cleansing. I need a new life. I'm giving myself to you. Wash me now. Put your Holy Spirit in me. Save me, Jesus. Because I believe that you died on the cross for me and rose again from the dead. And you are now my Lord and Savior. And all God's people said, Amen. 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 Okay, um, so here's what we're going to do. Listen carefully. Um, the, our campus is tore up. It's complicated right now. So watch my hands, everyone. These right here, they're going to go through that door. Everyone's going to go through that door that came forward. They're going to get a Bible, and they're going to go out the doors outside. You will have to reclaim them there but they're new, so it's good. The rest, listen, to get them, you have to go this way. Watch my hands. All the way around through the courtyard to pick them up. You know where the big fountain is almost directly behind me? There's a big fountain there. You'll, you'll pick up your family member there. We apologize, but we're growing, but I'm not gonna apologize for that, right? Father, I pray that you'd bless these that are here, these that have come forward. Father, I pray that you would just do your incredible, overwhelming thing that you do. I pray, Father God, that you'd preserve them and keep them in all of their ways. And there's no greater time to become a follower of Jesus than right now. Heal them, wash them clean, restore them. Do your miraculous work. Living water, son of God, bread of life. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. amen. Do we close on a song or are we too late? Are we okay? Okay, we're good. Wait, what? Yes? Is it too late? Okay. They, Gia, she said that you can sing the song. So you guys, while we sing this song, can you go this way and your family will meet you where you're gonna go. God bless you. God bless you guys. We'll, we'll see you Sunday. Chains break at the weight of your glory. I needed shelter, I was an orphan. Now you call me a citizen. Hey. When I was broken, you.